All right. Can I get into more? Unless you guys want to ask me some other questions, I would like to get into some some of these matters that has to do with the family court. I just want to go over this again. Just interrupt me. So what I'm thinking is family court is intruding on families. So you got you got uh, one of the spouses applying for a divorce or a separation or child custody, okay? And so this is not how it should work. The family itself is the final arbiter. And I, and I know this sounds biased. I'm, I'm just trying to, to express the concept here. So the husband and father is the final arbiter. And it has to do with liability, okay? And I, I've explained it before, but let's, let's talk about the court though. So what the court is doing is, okay, the parents... I, the ideal situation is the parents have a couple of children, okay? And let's say the children are seven years old and 10 years old, okay? And there's the arrangement of the parents take the children to school. Uh, they decide uh, what Christmas presents to get, where they're going to go on vacation, okay? So the, the parents have figured out how to take the money they make and apply it for the benefit of the children and the family and their all their well-being, okay? This is all, this is all decided. I mean, you, you know, as a parent, you know, you're go you're going to bed at night and you're saying, oh yeah, and you're talking to your wife or your husband about these details. These are very private, intimate details, and no one has the right to discover what those are, and it's none of their damn business. Okay, so what the court does is the court ignores all that. It says this is how it shall be because the legislature said so because you filed a divorce petition. Therefore, we're going to ignore any arrangement you already have. So my my point is that as parents. And even just husband and wife, you already have an arrangement as to how you're going to allocate your property for your benefit. And you figured that out from your own knowledge and wisdom of your own lifestyle. You have your own standards. The court completely ignores all that. The court then, what the court does is it seeks to impose a contractual term on the parties. So the court says, you're going to reach an agreement. And when you do, I need to approve it, right? The judge says, I want to approve it. And if you don't reach an agreement, I will tell you what the term is, and then you're going to follow it. And if you don't, I'm going to hold you in contempt and put you in jail until you follow it, right? Or I'm going to put you in jail and take your stuff or whatever. So how is the court able to do that when the court has no liability for the care of your family? The, the court is not accountable to you or your children. So how is it able to allocate, blindly allocate, re reallocate resources you've already figured out how to do yourself to be effective for what you want to do in your family? And, and the court just come in there like a bull in a china shop, right? And, and tell you what to do. Uh, it cannot. It does not have jurisdiction for that. Now, there are, there are times when the court does have jurisdiction, I think, when there's abuse or neglect, okay? But that's a special matter, and I believe that's for criminal court. It's not for family court. Family court should not exist, in my opinion. But we have this problem, all right? Now, the other aspect of this is that in a marriage, the definition of marriage is an agreement, right? It's a very special agreement. Well, guess what that is? If you're already married, your agreement's already established, and it is a living agreement. It does change. The terms are infinite, but it's already an established settled matter since when do courts get involved when the matter is already settled if i have a partnership agreement with somebody uh the matter is already settled right we have a contract right if i want to change the terms of the contract who do i have to talk to my partner because we have the agreement right can i go to the court and tell the court i don't like these terms anymore judge i want them changed to the following and then make my partner comply or and if he doesn't comply, he, the court can put him in jail? No. Well, then what the hell is they're doing that in a marriage? How is that legal? It's not. Why are we not seeing that? Why is this not being brought up in the court? Why is this analogy not being made as a legal argument? Because it's a business for lawyers. It's a franchise. It's a multi-billion dollar franchise. Why would they tell you these things? They don't do this for businesses, but they do it for a marriage? So the court cannot revise terms of a settled matter. It's without jurisdiction. Cannot impose new terms of an agreement between husband and wife. Cannot impose new terms of an agreement, whatever the agreement was. And the divorce court or family court ignores the marital agreements, ignores it all, and says you should do this. Why? The court has no liability, okay? So it can't 
require the reallocation of the resources that the the, the mom and dad or the husband and wife have have uh, already decided. They have unique wisdom over that, right? What about when they when you uh, go get a marriage license? Does that change the uh, liability or anything at all? The license does not, but residency does. So residency is established by licensing. So it's not the license per se; it's the residency. If you ever look at a, at a petition that's filed in family court, notice how you can go find one. Just go go to your uh, clerk of the court. I deliver them to the court all the time. <laughs> read the first page, and it says in there that. The husband is a resident and the wife is a resident. Yeah. Ah, that's it. That's what establishes jurisdiction. So the court has jurisdiction over residents, but it doesn't have jurisdiction to intrude upon a private membership association. Husband and wife are a private membership association. Absent discovery of any substantively evil conduct, court has no jurisdiction. Okay, I guess what I'm asking is when you apply for a marriage license, so that doesn't give control over in any way Not at to all. the court no. system? Got no, it. Like I just said, uh, the court has jurisdiction over the residents. That's that's um, based on resident. But as far as subject matter, I would argue that the family court does not have jurisdiction over the subject matter because it involves interfering with established agreements, settled matters, right? And a private membership association and fiduciary obligations that existed so, from the consummation of the marriage. So, so John, are you saying that you st we still have to set up, that we would have to still set up a, are you saying the actual marriage process? No, no, no your was, marriage is not the, the established the state. No, no, you're saying, I'm just like, you're saying that just the marriage itself is a PMA. Mm-hmm. Okay, it in itself. You're, you're not saying there's any more processes we need to do to, to establish that? No, it already is. No, it's, okay. it already, you don't have, there's no, you don't need an instrument that's a PMA. That's what a marriage is. It literally is a private membership association. That's why you'll see a lot of times in your documents, I will just simply name a PMA hmm. because your family is also a PMA. I mean, you can define it if you want to, but it's nobody's business but yours. A PMA is nobody's business, so you don't have to account to people. Like if I have a corporation, I need articles, and I have to tell the whole world that it exists now as a corporation because mm -hmm. there's a public interest mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't have to do that for a family. Right. Yeah, it's a PMA. So uh, again, that's another reason why the court doesn't have jurisdiction in a PMA, just like in a church. So what... So what documents or like what, I want to be able to have that protection and to, to say those things. Like what, The easiest what, way to do it is have a post-nuptial agreement. That really helps. But if you have to deal with the court, you can certainly do it on these grounds. Yeah. I mean, I'm just like, what, what kind of, you know, because it's very emotional getting involved with all this stuff. So I'd like to have like a, a document, kind of like you said, like almost an agreement, just kind of set set as paperwork, as set yeah. aside for. Here's said what you do. Here's what you do. You make a list uh, with your wife as to how money is being. You don't need okay, so you don't need a document for anybody's purpose but your own. And sure, sure. All, yeah, yeah. You all you do is making a record of what you're doing. It's not for anyone to see because. Even in a case where there's no, most cases, there's no, there's no documentation, right? So when I get a case, what I do is I ask the client to explain to me, and I ask them specific questions, who takes care of the children, how much money does it cost, all this, and I put together an affidavit and a declaration of trust. So you can mm -hmm. do that on demand as needed. But in the meantime, if you wanted to have some sort of record, what should be in, within your cognizance is this. What, how is money allocated in your family? How much, what's your, what's your budget? What do you spend on food? How many children do you have? Who decides? You know, what school you're going to, who decides what clothing, you know, uh, in my family, uh, important decisions I, I, I make, like, can, mm -hmm. can my, can my daughters uh, sign up for gymnastics? They're definitely going to ask me. They won't not just ask my wife and then she doesn't talk to me about it. They will ask me on something like that because that mm -hmm. takes up my time and it takes money. Right. So you have a list of all these things. It's a list of what you're already doing. So it'll fit into the categories of what the court would call alimony, child support and, and child custody. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't like to I don't like to call it alimony because alimony implies someone else is telling you what to do with your money. Right. So it's just the financial support that 
you're providing. So if, if your wife is providing financial support and you are also, which is true in many situations, that money is part of the family trust. And mm -hmm. the husband and father is the fiduciary over that money. Even though the wife made that money, it's not hers. I know we joke about that and you know this is in comedy and all this stuff, but really when the money comes into the household, it's the property of the trust and the fiduciary is the husband and the father. Now, it doesn't have to be. I'm just saying naturally it is. It has been for, for centuries. So, so there's the financial support. Then you have child care and custody. Like maybe the maybe your wife is going to take the children to school every day, right? Maybe you pick them up. That's your child custody arrangement. And it's all within the same household. When one spouse wants to leave the household, why does that custody arrangement have to change? Doesn't. Mm -hmm. It could. It doesn't. But the court wants to change it. it. You know, if you're the final arbiter, I would just say no. It was fine sure. the way it was. Yeah. If you want to leave that community, fine. Because... Let's say the wife wants to leave. She was the beneficiary of the trust and she wants to leave the household and change the way the, the benefits are, are administered. No, I'll do it if I want to, but as a fiduciary, I have that option and no court can take, to take away my property rights that I've ex exercised for years. How can, how can I verbalize that to a court? Okay, once you explain made, once when somebody's made that claim. So what, this like, is what a, kind of document do I have to have so prepared the legal, for myself to talk the, about the, that? The, the legal argument is the court is intruding upon a fiduciary obligation that you have, and it's called trespass. It's a tort in trespass. You have a fiduciary obligation to care for your children and family, and uh, you already have the matter of providing for the beneficiaries, your children and your wife. Okay. So if the wife wants to leave, then you're still willing to provide the benefits, but under your terms, if she wants to change right. the terms, she does not have the right to get the court involved. She has to deal with you. You're the trustee. Okay. Makes sense. And, and the it, judges understand they just don't right now. It's too new for them. I, we, we have to catch up a lot, but the judges cannot interfere with a trust relationship. <laughs> they can't break a trust. It's an irrevocable trust. Yeah. So what formal like words like can I, is it just, we just, we just put okay. them on notice whenever somebody makes that claim afterwards or, it, you know, more or less. I mean, this is why I have a whole video series on how to do this. Um, right. So you can become educated and yeah, it, it's a bit of an art yeah, yeah. to express it. But I mean, I could tell you some of it on calls like this. But like what I just told you, the language I just gave you was it's a mm -hmm. tort and trespass. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a fiduciary obligation that is under administration. Okay, so how can the wife say for, I, I just give this example, I'm not demonizing women or wives, but how can the wife demand that the trustee change everything because she chose to leave that arrangement? She's still the beneficiary. What is she complaining about? She's not benefiting the yeah. way she wants to benefit, you know, so the court doesn't yeah, have yeah, the, yeah. the, you're already providing the benefit. So how can the court order you to provide the benefit a different way? See? Yeah. You know, yeah, that's why, see, that's why I say it's a I settled guess. matter <laughs> hmm. and, and it's a fiduciary. Yeah. It's a fiduciary and it's a fiduciary involving minor children. How does the court get in there with minor children and, and interfere with the manner in which you've chosen to serve them and protect them and care for them when the court has zero liability and you have all the liability. Right. Okay. Yeah, the court can't do it if they have zero liability, right? Yeah, unless judge, unless you want to be uh, liable to my family, shut up! <laughs> you don't have the right to even talk to me! <laughs> <laughs> so here's how you divorce here's how you divorce the state, okay? Here's the easy way. Remove the state from your marriage by simply including an arbitration clause that's compulsory and binding in a postnuptial agreement. Now, this is only a partial step because you're still pr presumably bringing in an officer of the court because an arbitrator is typically going to be an attorney. You have to write the contract in a way that handles that. I'm not saying I'm not going to give you too many specifics because it can go in so many directions and it's, it's kind of crazy. I'm just saying use a postnuptial agreement and a binding okay. arbitration clause, and that gets the judges out of your marriage. That's number one. Then okay. you got some more things. So what's going to happen is as you start doing this, you're going to find that you have more 
responsibility and you have to have more awareness as to what you're actually doing. It's just like, if I have, if I carry my own car insurance, that sounds cool, but it's really not. <laughs> It's just a different way to manage. The risk is still there, you know. Yeah, I just yeah, you're still to, risking. Yeah, that's it's just what I like, it's a lot more money. A lot more money you got to hold on to. It, it's a risk I'm willing to take, and so forth. And yeah. you're willing to take it, right? Yeah. Right. So, so be be aware that if you're going to take on this path, which I recommend. I mean, who wants this fool telling you what to do with your damn money? Yeah, I don't want to. And, yeah, and and uh, he's doing it because the gang, the gang of legislators figured out, made up some numbers, arbitrary numbers that you're going to comply with. Mm. Come on. That's like if I if I love this analogy. If I come in your house uh, after work, you're sitting there watching TV, and I come in your house, just don't even knock on the door. Just open the door, walk in there, grab a beer in the fridge, sit down next to you, grab the remote control, and start watching TV. You'd probably beat the shit out of me, right? And Rob, you should. Mm -hmm. So what the heck is the judge thinking? Mm -hmm. He's basically doing the same thing. Yeah, the spending that, your money. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is judges that are doing this are also men and probably have their own family. <laughs> Why can't they see that? <laughs> you, would you want me doing that to your family? What are you doing That's to mine? Right. Yeah, right. I don't care what the statute says. Statutes don't apply in that situation. Oh, that's cool. So, all right. Good job, Steph. It's a great example. I mean, new license controlled area. I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. You guys are having a conversation on chat. Okay. Anyways, I just want to mention that because, again, I, lately I've been talking about property rights, and this is a great example, okay? So in family court, it's really all about property rights. I mean, it is it isn't any – so right. you can sue somebody for breach of contract, and you can get damages. That doesn't mean the judge changes the contract. He's just making a decision on if whether or not it was breached and to what extent, right? So there's two aspects in any I'm, litigation. I'm, it's going to be liability I'm, and, I'm, and how much. Or nine ten ninety nine. Okay. Um, All right. It's liability and how much. So uh, that's why, uh, as a quick example, that's why I've got a couple of cases right now where the attorney is like talking about, let's go to a settlement conference. So we go to the settlement conference, and I tell my client, make sure that you don't talk about money at all. And they're like, wait a minute, it's a settlement conference. Exactly. Don't talk about money because you're going to cheat yourself out of the money if you don't first talk about liability. Make them talk about liability first and establish liability. Do not mention money. Establish what percent of liability or the nature of the liability, however the case is. Once you establish liability and you've got a list of stipulations because that's how you do it, then you can talk about money. They don't want to do that. They want to talk about, let's pay this and make it go away. How much do you want? And then you, you, you come up with a number which makes you give the first offer that's what they're trained to do, okay? They're very clever. They get you to make the first offer, and then they come back and say, well, the insurance only covers $5,000, you see? That's how they negotiate. See, the way they negotiate is in bad faith because they get you, they trick you into making the first offer, and then they say there's a third party who's not part of the discussion that's determining how much we can offer you. That's bad faith, you see? Anyways, that might be a little off subject, but what I was talking about was the uh, property rights. Uh yeah, or a divorce couple where the ex comes back many years where the child is now an adult, but the ex is now looking to sue. Yeah, okay, so for back child support, again, what you do is, okay, anytime there's already been a matter uh, in, in family court uh, that's resolved and it's years down the road, what you want to do is go back to the original documents or the, the most recent documents that led to that situation, which would be the divorce decree, the court order, okay? And then you challenge the court order. This is in my video series. It tells you how to challenge the court order. That's what I would do.